Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Farming Together's second webinar episode of seven, uh, Collaborative Solutions for Farmers, Fishers and Foresters. My name is Amanda Scott. I'm the pro manager from the Farming Together program, and my colleague here, Simone Lom, uh, is the amazing facilitator for the evening. Now, if you missed our first uh, webinar last week that was a great one on sharing your data with Birdship Cropping Group. You can um, find that one on our website farmingtogether.com.au. Uh, tonight we're lucky enough to have uh, two fabulous women doing amazing things in their community uh, for our out-of-the-box solution uh, episode tonight. So Out of the Box Solutions is about community supporting agriculture and agriculture supporting community. Uh, we know that food distribution has become increasingly popular uh, in COVID outbreak with um, food distribution boxes. And we're gonna hear from two of these amazing community minded women who help create food box solutions that support local small scale producers and then give them greater access to clean and fair food. So our first presenter this evening is Deborah Bogan Huber from Out of the Box, a Mildura based food project which grows small scale regenerative growers and connects them with local buyers. And our second guest speaker from for this evening coming direct and live from the markets I believe is uh, Clarence Valley Food Inc. Chairperson, Deb Novak. Now, Deb's acted fast during COVID crisis to establish a delivery service for Yamba Farmer Market and Producers Market Storeholders, which is maintaining sales post pandemic. So welcome uh, tonight to our audience and to our guest speakers who we'll hear from in a minute. So welcome Deborah Bogan Huber. Thank you, uh, Amanda and Simone. And I have, um, after a little glitch, managed to restart my computer and um, zoom in from the computer instead of my phone. So all is well. Um, if I'm able to share my screen, I will. Um, Are you able to do that now, Deborah? Yeah. Let's... Okay, so um, I'm Deb Bogenhuber from uh, Food Next Door Co-op in, um, I'm getting a bit of feedback, uh, based in Mildura in uh, Northwest Victoria. And I will take you through um, a, bit of, a bit of our journey and our story over the past four years or so. And, um, one of the things that we were asked to talk to were, were some of the challenges um, and the, the sort of problems that we're addressing uh, in the work that we do. So I'll, I'll certainly be talking a lot about those. Um, just going to minimise that. So uh, just on the welcome slide here, uh, we have had a lot of great support, fantastic support from the Victorian government. Uh, for our work and the two photos here are of the two farms that we currently um, have access to, our community demonstration farm on the left and the river farm on the right and two of our uh, farmers and also staff of the co-op on that slide. So, um, our, act our weekly local produce box scheme is actually called Out of the Box. And uh, it's, it's a weekly or fortnightly subscription model of uh, locally sourced produce that's grown using regenerative practices. We have three uh, box sizes that uh, customers can choose from, small, medium and large for $25, $35 and $50. And the three pillars of of the scheme are that everything is 100% local, that's guaranteed, usually within about a 50 kilometre radius of Mildura. Uh, it's grown to organic or regenerative um, farming practices and it uh, supports the local community and I'll talk more about that as we go. 
So I guess really our work started um, with wanting to connect uh, people in our community who uh, wanted to eat local produce with local produce. I've been here for about 14 years. I'm not originally from Mildura and the thing that really um, stood out for me when I first arrived 14 years ago was that there was no fruit and vegetable shop here. And this region is known as a food bowl. So this was quite a, a perplexing um, problem for me when I arrived. And with the work that we started doing around, around four years ago, um, it was something that we heard a lot in the conversations that we had that people wanted better access to local produce. So we started with this um, local produce box scheme out of the box as a three month trial. Uh, we limited that to 30 boxes a week and um, gave it a go to see how it would go. And what became really apparent um, was that we didn't actually have enough produce in our region to fill those boxes. And that, this was partly because we, we very much wanted produce that was grown to organic standards. So there was some other produce around that didn't, didn't meet those standards, but overall, we actually had a lack of small scale farmers. So I'll talk more to that. Um, I just wanted to show you quickly, this is the landing page of our out of the box website, which is a, it's a Shopify uh, online store. And just wanted to draw your attention to at the top there, um, in case you can't read it, it says for each box, $1 is donated to Food Next Door trainee farmers. And there's a button there that you can click on and that amount is updated each week. We've started recording this from the 1st of July this year. So uh, since the 1st of July, we've um, sold 1,426 boxes, which is, um, which is great. So um, out of the box is really just one part of our story as a co-op. Um, I mentioned that we, we, we really, th through starting out of the box as a trial, identified this actually much bigger problem of um, not having enough small scale farmers in our region who were growing food for our community. So a lot of the farms here are um, medium to large scale and almost all of the produce is exported from the region. So one of the main uh, crops grown here are grapes, table grapes. Um, there are also wine grapes and, and dried fruit, uh, sultanas and the like. Um, apparently from the, the table grapes grown here, um, about 99% of those are exported from the region, which is quite staggering. So I'll just take you through um, our model. And it, it starts here really with um, two, two things. So when we identified this problem of uh, a lack of small scale farmers, we were pretty lucky to connect with a research project that had been looking into um, the skills and knowledge of new migrant farmers in Australia. Mildura was one of their main study sites and how those skills and knowledge translated in the Australian context. And the main finding of this research was that, um, that quite simply it didn't because these farmers didn't have the resources to access land. And so once they arrived here, uh, they, they were no longer farming. So we, we suddenly connected with this um, community of farmers in living here in Mildura and Sunraysia who weren't farming. So we thought, great, okay, we've got, we've got people who want local produce and are willing to, to pay for it and buy it. And, and now we've found some, some farmers, fantastic, who want, who want to live here, they want to grow food and um, they come from a background of farming without chemicals. So the other unique thing in our region is that we have a lot of unused land. So um, Mildura is a, is a desert environment. Our average rainfall is less than 300 millimetres a year. 
and you you pretty much can't grow anything in, certainly not vegetables or fruit without irrigation so um, we have a we have a d discrete district irrigation district where um, there's an irrigation network to um, to be able to grow food here and um, for, for various reasons, I, I won't go into it, it's quite complex, but we have around 20 to 25% of land in the irrigation district that, that was once used for growing food, no longer being utilised. So it's sitting vacant. Um, it's, some of it still has vines on it that have, that have died quite a, quite a long time ago. So we, we have um, landless farmers, as we refer to them, and we have farmerless land. And the co-op um, managed to, to pilot a project that, that matched these landless farmers with farmless land to be able to grow food for our community. And uh, that pilot project was um, successful in the sense that the farmers grew uh, four years of a maize crop on there that they harvested. Um, but since then, we, we've learned a lot along the way and been able to d develop a model that's, um, that's now really um, producing food that, that's coming into the broader community here in Mildura. So, um, just when you thought we were solving all the problems, <laughs> the next problem, as I mentioned, we live in the desert and um, you can't really grow anything without irrigation. But the, the thing here is that you, you can have land, but the land doesn't necessarily have water attached to it. So, um, so we now had a problem of how do we get water? How do we buy water? Um, when, when it's a really dry year here, as it was last year and the year before, water prices go uh, through the roof and it becomes completely unaffordable for small scale farmers to buy water to grow food. So um, we, we had to do some out of the box thinking and um, we're lucky enough to get some support from, again, the Victorian government through their, um, the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning to establish a community water bank. And that water bank accepts donations of temporary water from water holders which are then able to be um, utilised by small scale farmers um, who are members of Food Next Door at a, at a price that's reasonable in order to, to produce some um, food. So, um, so we've, we've solved all our problems, not really, but um, we're, we're on our way to doing that. We now have around 20 uh, new migrant farmers all um, with their own plots growing food that they're able to share with their families uh, within their community. They're starting to sell that produce to um, out of the box. So the food hub in this diagram is, um, is, a, is another future vision, um, but at the moment it's, it's being sold through out of the box, which guarantees a fair return back to the farmer. So a minimum 50% of the box retail price is returned to the farmer. And then you can see on the left of that diagram that any other profits are um, fed back into the co-op to continue to support farmers um, to access land and, and other tools and support that they need to be able to farm. Um, I'll just mention as well that we launched our own training program uh, last month. Um, it's not a registered training program, but we're um, delivering that for new migrant farmers to learn the skills and, um, and, and have the experience over 12 months of farming at the community demonstration farm to, um, to then be able to go off and, and have their own farming enterprise if, if that's what they then want to go on and do. Uh, thank you. And I'm welcome, I welcome questions. Beautiful. Thank you, Deborah. That was fantastic. Um, I do know your story, but I, I always pick up more little bits as uh, every time I learn a little bit more. And it was wonderful to hear it again. So thank you for sharing it. 
Um, we do have a couple of questions and if anyone has any more, now's your time to put them into the chat box. The first one we've got is from Greg McGee. How did you establish the contents that would fill the boxes from week to week? Did it depend on the available produce from a small group of farmers? Yeah, so um, the contents of the boxes change from week to week. Um, de de depending on what's available, that's exactly right. We do have around um, probably half a dozen regular suppliers, which includes a couple of larger scale certified organic properties who supply things like avocados and citrus that are sort of longer growing things. And the rest comes from um, a couple of small scale growers who actually started uh, farming with um, a sense of security that out of the box would buy all their produce. So they hadn't actually been farming at any sort of scale when um, out of the box started. And we've been able to work together um, for these farmers to grow things that our customers want. So we're often surveying our, our customers or just talking to them every week when they come to pick up their boxes to um, get a sense of other types of vegetables they might want to see um, and then encouraging our suppliers to, to grow those things. So, you know, we've, we've been going for three years and certainly now our customers are saying, um, the produce is so much better than it was last year or the year before, but it's because we've, you know, got this really close working relationship and be because it's a subscription model, our growers have a really um, consistent order every week. So they know if, if we say, hey, our customers would love sweet potato, they know that we're going to buy X kilos of sweet potato off them every week for as long as they have it. So that relationship's been um, really important to, to growing. Fantastic. Um, and Karen's asked, did you buy the land or is it leased? And what is the process to do this? Yeah, so the land is accessed through um, a land share agreement with the landholder. So the two properties that we currently have access to, we're not um, making any financial contribution to the landholder. Uh, in both cases, they had um, a a part of their property that they didn't want to use themselves, but they wanted to see being used. And through personal relationships, um, they, they offered that access to us. So we go through a process of developing the agreement over time with the landholder that ensures that we're really clear on um, what the expectations are, what the roles and responsibilities are of, of the co-op and of the landholder. And those agreements are five year agreements initially. I've actually got a question that I might sneak in here. Um, no one else has got one at the moment. Uh, it sounds like it just has kept expanding. Like it just seems like there's new initiative after new initiative. Have you got like a long term plan about the things that you are wanting to do? Or is it as a challenge presents itself that you then go, oh, okay, I see that challenge as an opportunity. How about we try doing this next? Um, probably a bit of both. Our, our long-term plan is to see the landscape here uh, full of small-scale farms growing organic produce for our region. Um, we have a population of about 60,000 within, within probably a 50 kilometre radius of Mildura. We have 14 supermarkets. I think two of those are locally owned. And we have one fruit and vegetable shop that supports local farmers. So there is a huge potential here for, um, for a strong local food system. And it, like we, we're only just scratching the surface with what we're doing. And 
in terms of expansion, so, th so that's a vision for the landscape. We'd love to have a food hub. Um, but actually since COVID, I think this has been consistent, um, certainly in Australia, but I, I think around the world that local food has been really sought out by people. So our um, subscriber numbers for Out of the Box have almost doubled since um, the, the start of restrictions for COVID. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Deborah. We've got uh, Tamara has asked, are the farmers limited to migrants or can young farmers and those wanting to enter the industry otherwise get involved? Yeah, so our two um, probably principal suppliers are um, young farmers who are not new migrants. Um, the community demonstration farm is um, at the moment has uh, just new migrant farmers accessing that. And so does the other property, the river farm. But where, um, so our primary purpose, the primary purpose of the co-op is um, the relief of suffering and distress of, of new migrants and refugees through supporting them to reconnect with farming, but we're not exclusive. So if there are young farmers who don't have their own land and don't have resources to access their own land, who came to us asking for support, we, we would talk to them about how we could support them. Yeah, it definitely seems like a model that could be transferred into, you know, if other people are inspired to do it in their region that, you know, could be done with young farmers as well. Um, Karen just had a secondary question um, around the agreements um, between the landholders and the farmers. Were the agreements drawn up by lawyers or is it an informal arrangement? So the agreements uh, were not drawn up by lawyers, but we do have a, um, a legal team who um, do pro bono legal work for us who have reviewed them. And we've made a few adjustments um, to them. We, we're a registered charity, so there were a few things we had to change for that. Um, and the agreements are between the landholder and the co-op, um, not with individual farmers. And then the co-op manages the relationship and the agreements then with the farmers. So that there's sort of two processes there. Fantastic, thank you. And um, Greg's asked as well, have you used community banks to assist in marketing the concept to potential customers? Community banks. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Greg. Did you want to add something else to the chat there, Greg, to explain that a little bit more? You can go to the next. Yeah, we might just ask Douglas's question while Greg's just completing that one. What do you think was the secret to success in securing initial government funding support? Oh, um, having all the right ingredients at the right time. Um, the process of securing support was very lengthy. Um, so we've sort of had a few different, we, when we started out of the box, we had some seed funding from um, the federal government through the Farming Together program, which, um, which helped get out of the box sort of up and established in that first year, which was great. And then um, the, the, the bigger stuff around developing, establishing a community farm and supporting, supporting farmers, that was really the hard sell. Um, it, it sat, it, it didn't fall neatly into any box. And, um, you know, government doesn't do well with that. Um, so it, it took us about 15 months um, from when the, the Victorian government said, we'll give you this money to when we actually got the money. Um, and that during that time, we developed a business case. We had really, I think the secret, it's, it's not a secret, but it's, 
it's about relationships. So we had, you know, we had really good relationships with researchers um, that I've mentioned before who were working on that project, um, with other forms of support to help us write a business case to really identify what the problems were that we were trying to solve. We had friends um, or supporters in um, multicultural affairs in the Victorian government, as well as in agriculture. Um, we had a local community actually that was extremely um, galvanised around wanting to see this happen. So, you know, the co-op itself with its members, the, the, the new migrant farmers who um, are from Burundi and Democratic Republic of Congo are so uh, persistent in, um, they, just, they just want to grow food. So we had all of these ingredients sort of together that kept, kept it going. Um, that 15 months was a really hard slog. And I, without all of those people um, saying, yeah, you've got, you've got to keep going, you've got to help us, you've got to help us access land, you've got to help us farm, um, you know, I probably would have given up. So it, it was um, but very much from, from the grassroots that um, that was why we succeeded in getting that funding. Yeah, beautifully said. We couldn't agree more. It's all about relationships here at Farming Together too. Yeah. Um, I'll just complete Greg's question, Deborah. So um, the question was in regards to if you'd used community banks to assist in marketing the concept to potential customers, because in some rural areas there are community banks to support businesses. Um, so Greg, I'm not sure if you mean things like the Bendigo Community Bank. We do we do have one here uh, who we bank with. Um, we haven't received any support from them to date, but um, we, we have a good relationship with them and, and we've actually just applied for a small grant from them. So, um, yeah. Um, and just take this last one from Tanvia. How involved are the co-op, uh, how involved are the members of the co-op? So our farmer members are extremely involved. Um, they are at the farm, um, well, all the time uh, to, to grow food. We have, uh, we have a farmer meeting every week on Zoom now um, with the leaders, sort of the farm leaders who are able to communicate things back to, um, to the other farmers. We have uh, quite a few volunteer members. So our co-op's a multi-stakeholder co-op. Um, so we have, we have farmer members, consumer members, uh, volunteer members, and also landholder members. So um, I'd say most of them are, are pretty engaged and involved in what we do. Yeah, beautiful. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Deborah. If you want to, if you want to stay on, there might be some other questions that come up through the webinar. And I will now invite uh, Deborah Novak to speak live from the Grafton market. So am I correct, Deborah? Grafton today. Yeah, fantastic. And I'll just take you off mute there too, Deborah. Wonderful. Right. Hi, everybody. And uh, welcome from live from uh, the Grafton Twilight Farmers Market. We are actually on uh, Bundjalung country and we are in the region of the Clarence Valley where we have three First Nation people, peoples, um, the Gumbangir, Bundjalung and Yagel. And I make a point of saying this today because we're celebrating and acknowledging it's NAIDOC week and we have um, our, uh, a number of uh, First Nation people here as storeholders for the first time. So we're really excited. So hello. <laughs> and please forgive me for about the lighting and you know, the interruptions because it's actually packed down time now. So um, yeah. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it looks okay. fantastic, Deb, on, on scene. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, and the lights came on even better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe not so, but anyway, yeah, no. Hey, um, look, just um, I'll just start off with um, just a brief outline of who I am and what I'm doing, and if, just jump in and ask any questions at any time. I'm more than happy to, um, you know, pass on, you know, the knowledge. So, uh, yes, my name is Deborah Novak. I'm chair of an organisation called Clarence Valley Food Inc. Uh, our life began as an organisation um, on the back of a public meeting for National Ag Day in 2017. So Australia's first day of celebrating our uh, primary producers in 2017. So. I uh, had been elected to council in Clarence Valley Council as an elected councillor in 2016 and uh, saw that there didn't um, really appear to be a, a, a support network for farmers in our community. So felt the need to convene this public meeting and we had over 40 people attend and from there we formed our skills-based board. So our skill-based board is based, um, has a, a lawyer, a, an accountant, a media professional, a political strategist, a surveyor, a strategic planner, and um, a, a farmer who has a retail and wholesale um, uh, butcher, so, and a fifth generation. Everybody, all of us are involved in um, farming in some way or another, whether it's running a farm. Um, I was probably the weak link, I might add. Um, I've only just become a farmer again, but I do farm sit, so I actually think that does count. Um, and some sizable properties like 10,000 acres, which I guess to some people is pretty small. <laughs> but um, yeah, I can saddle a horse and ride a horse. So <laughs> Hopefully I tick that box. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, look, the public meeting was really great. We got some great feedback. And the reason we actually began, we saw this really extraordinary opportunity with the new Grafton Jail, um, Australia's largest jail being um, built here in um, the Clarence Valley. So we saw that as a, an opportunity to um, do some sustainable um, uh, long-term farming um, practices to support our producers for 20 years. So we we met with um, uh, the organisers who were you know, doing the jail and we noticed that they didn't have a, a local procurement policy. So we worked with the minister, we worked with the minister, the federal member, the state member and the um, the local mayor to uh, have included in the uh, the jail a 30% local procurement policy, which uh, they all agreed to and now support, which is a part of their um, procurement policy, which is wonderful. So from there, um, we've, uh, in my role as, um, I guess, um, entrepreneur, uh, I took on um, the Yamba Farmers Market came up for a uh, tender and uh, nobody was putting in to um, go for it. So I approached the local um, uh, Rotary and Lions Club to see if they would be interested and no one said that they wanted to take it on. So um, I thought it'd been going for eight years and I just saw that there was too much of an opportunity to let it go by the by. So uh, I applied for the tender, got the tender, and uh, that was two years ago. So when I took over the tender, I had 15 stalls, and uh, now two years later, I've got it to 44 stalls, and I've put um, the farming back into the farmer's market. So uh, it's very exciting. We have some very, very strict rules. I have a number of my storeholders say I'm the strictest farmer's market on the North Coast. I actually don't have a problem with that because uh, um, my storeholders know that I can back them. Um, but it's very hard to um, pull the wool over my eyes. Uh, for me to have uh, this, to build this relationship with our consumers and our storeholders and our farmers, it's all about trust. And trust means you have to have a set of rules that you stand by and that the customer, you know, comes to respect. And that is our point of difference from, you know, any commercial um, supermarkets that 
we have uh, a lock of all footprint, uh, an enforced lock of all footprint. I do farm inspections. Most people don't know I actually have 10 years as an organic grower. I don't tell too many people that. <laughs> I think it's really important that um, element of surprise is good. Uh, and then um, just recently, I've taken over the Grafton Twilight, well, Grafton Farmers Market. I was invited to, um, and that's not my music, um, I was invited to take over the Grafton Farmers Market that had only seven stalls and around 250 customers moving through in the morning. And then um, I was invited to take it over or manage it, coordinate it. And I said only if I could relocate it to the obvious centre of town called Market Square, which was designated a, um, a, a place for farmers in 1848 to sell their produce. And this is the first time. <laughs> I mean, bull, um, bull, unbelievable. But anyway. Um, so from taking it on uh, a few, six weeks ago, we've gone from seven stalls to 25 stalls and gone from serving 250 people to serving 1,500 people. So um, that is really exciting. So uh, the pandemic hit um, in March and uh, I have a background in um, media. So I've done 25 years as a media professional specialising in digital content producing. And uh, so it was really wonderful to be able to sit there and work out and go, and I love, obviously I love a challenge and go, oh, how do we survive this? <laughs> so we, nobody was doing food boxes in our town of Yamba. So, um, I mean, it's an absolute no brainer to do it because you've got 44 stores there to pick and choose from. So the hardest part was picking the pictures to put on the website. So for those who are there now, you're more than likely got your um, phone there in front of you. You can have a look at the Yamba Farmers Delivery website that tells you exactly what we're doing. We've also, if you want to have a look at the Grafton uh, Twilight Farmers Market and the Yamba Farmers and Producers Market Facebook pages and Insta pages, you'll get to see um, I'm very proactive on those sites. If you go in and have a look at the Yamba Farmers and Producers Market website, um, that features all our storeholders and, um, and that will give you a really good idea of um, who we're working with, um, the extraordinary storeholders that we are working with and, uh, and just the amazing um, uh, members of our community who just love us to death. And uh, in particular, those people who love to just shop with us fortnightly, spend $300, Put that on the table and go, yep, yeah, just give us the best of what you've got to go. So, I mean, it's about building that trust. And, uh, and for me and our community, they, when the pandemic hit, and, yeah, and for those who don't know Yamba, Yamba was voted the best town in Australia 11 years ago and um, because it didn't have a McDonald's, one of the reasons. And... Um, and we went into complete lockdown where we've gone from having 12 to 1500 people shop with us day, you know, through that four hour period to only 250 people shopping with us. But boy, didn't they show their love and their loyalty to us because they moved from spending, you know, a small amount of money to four times as much money with us. And uh, it was extraordinary because they were um, my store, and how I can tell how good my storeholders are doing is they broke all their sales records during the pandemic. So that says everything. And you know, for the locals to come out there and support us and then support the boxes as well has just been extraordinary. So the boxes were, um, uh, we tr I tried a few different boxes, but I just thought, you know, it, We've got so much amazing produce there that, you know, just putting it in packages, you know, like, you know, a farm box or a, um, a meat box or a, a gourmet box just made it easier because it's just too much to choose from. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, tough problem, I know, but, you know, it made it difficult for me. And um, so anyway, I thought, you know, it's got to get easier, surely. So, um, and that's what we did. So what you see on the Yamba Farmers Delivery um website now is what people um, can purchase anytime. And we did, um, and have to say, I always swore I would never ever do online um, food orders, 
because to me that completely defeated the purpose of having a farmer's market because the farmer's market um, is so extraordinary for the farmers and themselves, for their mental health and well-being, um, for them to connect with their customers. Some of the extraordinary tales some of my storeholders have had to have told me to get to our farmer's market through the fires last year, driving through flames. I mean, extraordinary. And then to be able to share those stories with their customers, it's just like, you know, captive audience has been really extraordinary. So, so through the pandemic, um, we had uh, no food security problems um, within the farmer's market. You know, clearly some of the supermarkets did, um, but we had no supply chain interruptions, interruptions at all. Fantastic. Which, you know, goes to show the strength of our, um, our community here in the Clarence Valley. We've got uh, 60 commodities uh, produced here. We've got over 2,500 registered farms. Uh, our population of the Clarence Valley is 53,000 people over 10,000 square kilometres. We are um, uh, lots of sugarcane, macadamia, beef, huge horticultural area, uh, blueberries, rab raspberries, everything. And, you know, you can do your entire shop at the farmer's market because we have uh, milk, we have um, you know, organic uh, sourdough bread, uh, really full range of produce. And I have to say, I got the most amazing um, uh, feedback from uh, a young guy last night who shops with us every week. He's only lived in Yamba for nine months. And he said, what I love about your farmer's market is what is the best thing in the world? The greatest things in the world can all be found at your farmer's market. And I go, oh. <laughs> so, and I said, and he wasn't there this Wednesday. And I said to him, well, where were you? And he's gone, oh, I was down working cloth. I said, you know, you can do online ordering. <laughs> he's gone, no. <laughs> so, uh, you know, another convert there, I think. So, yeah, anyway. Um, any questions? That's enough for me talking. Yeah. I hope there's somebody out there. Is that crickets I can hear? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Deborah. Always love hearing you talk about um, your stories. And I got a <laughs> particularly the extra add ons from last night. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. It's, it's just so inspiring what you're doing and, and great to hear that's being recognised in different regions in the area as well. Um, yeah. We've got a question from an M. Willis. How did you organise the deliveries? Okay, so that was, I'll tell you what, that was really quite interesting. So, showed what was lacking in our region for a start. It was very difficult to find a refrigerated transport. So, when you, um, and because we had meat, we were offering, you know, um, you know, beef, pork, chicken. We wanted to have that full range. We couldn't, living in a regional area, we couldn't find a um, refrigerated truck. And so as luck would have it, one of my storeholders had a refrigerated truck sitting in their, um, in the back of their shop that was their spare truck. So, um, and as luck would also have it, he had an idle sister. <laughs> so I hired the sister and the truck as a job lot. And, um, but you know, that was the great thing, you know, in um, doing the, um, uh, the food boxes, we didn't do it to generate, you know, income. I mean, we do it as not a wholesale price, retail price. We pay, um, you know, uh, the going rate. But what it did was it, it made enough money to employ somebody and to pay for a refrigerated truck that went all around the Clarence Valley. And when you're doing delivering that sort of service, you actually, as a part of the New South Wales Food Authority standard, have to deliver in a truck like that when you've got meat and milk. Thank you. Um, Tanvi has asked or said that she hasn't heard about a weekday market. How is that? Sorry, a weekday? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so it's, um, so the Yamba Farmers Market is Wednesday mornings between 7 and 11. And uh, very, um, it's changed a lot since I've taken it over. Uh, I did a major risk assessment uh, of the market and started using uh, a lot of social media, made it very 
uh, user friendly for young mums and elderly people. Uh, where now it's just really easy shop for those people. And so we've gone from, and, and basically that Wednesday morning market, you have to be consistent. So I don't have um, any, I don't use casual storeholders at all. They have to be permanent or seasonal. And of my 44 storeholders now, 43 are permanent and um, only one seasonal. And a lot of them were seasonal. I just said to them, you know, if you want to, you know, make a, a good living, um, we need to lift all our games and we need to uh, have our um, stalls as we are running a business. So there was some hard conversations to have in there. I wouldn't insure any of the businesses because I said, why should I love your business more than you do? So you need to get your own insurance and put your grown up business pants on. Um, I also felt too that I didn't want the storeholders thinking, because it's very competitive when you're you know, competing against the major supermarkets. Your, your presentation is really important too. You can't look like, you know, look good, look, you know, look like a farmer, look, you know, look sexy or whatever, but don't look like you've just got out of bed because people, that's a real put off, you know, and it's about that level of customer service and, and my storeholders have really lifted. We've put on workshops um, through the New South Wales Small Business Commissioner, um, funded workshops for merchandising, so making their um, stalls look amazing. You know, there's a, in the rules, you have to have, um, you know, like registered kitchens, you have to have, um, you know, proper labelling so that, you know, it's not a backyard job, it actually is a a small startup and you know if you want to grow your business you can we've even sold stalls now which is fantastic so we're in that market of selling businesses which is wonderful and um, and here in the Grafton Twilight it's um, like I said it went from uh, uh, seven seven to eleven in the morning but we moved it to a twilight market because they just wouldn't there wasn't the support there and I wanted to grow the market so with no marketing, um, we've gone from 250 stalls to, sorry, 250 shoppers to between 1,200 and 1,500 shoppers now, which it's word of mouth, you know. And I have, like I said, I have that media background. Um, word of mouth is 70% of your sales. And like tonight, we actually had the, um, the Grafton, uh, Clarence Valley Chamber Orchestra play. It was so beautiful. They just did a pop up and um, did a big jam session here. And it was just so beautiful and just engaging in that, you know, that as the sun was going down and so many young families, you know, sitting around just listening. It was just really beautiful. That's amazing, and it's been lovely to watch it get darker behind you as well. Yeah. Oh, a bit scary. <laughs> um, I just wanted to check if anyone else had any um, questions. I actually had one for, for both you and Deb. Um, Deborah, I don't know if Deb, you're still there. Yeah. I was really interested. Like, I, I see the projects that both of you are doing as being almost. Um, central to your communities now and I'm really curious I know it's not something that can be really measured but has there been any way of seeing the flow and effect outwards to your communities more generally? Definitely uh, so because I'm a counsellor and I have that media background everything is evidence-based for me so I don't want to hear fluff I don't want to hear fairy tales I want to seek hardcore evidence because people ask me that where did you, how did you come up with that? So I employ people to do the counters into coming into the market to count people. So I can tell you exactly how many people have signed in, QR code edited in, um, and then I've had counters on. And then we've done surveys already. So I do surveys in my market in Yamba. Uh, so for instance, in Yamba, um, they used to always have music and then I stopped having music. Uh, because it was just too head banging for me at that hour of the morning, it just was too loud and nobody missed the music. And when I did a survey, I thought, oh, better do a survey here. <laughs> uh, so, you know, are you here for the food? Are you here for social? Are you here for the music? 
and only three people said they were there for the music. So my research told me no one cared about the music. <laughs> but it's different for the twilight because it's, you know, it's a different atmosphere altogether. But hearing, um, and I ask the people, always ask them, you know, I walk around, ask the storeholders and I ask the, our customers, how is it, you know, what is it you like? So I get that feedback and then we do the written down surveys as well. And everybody's talking about it, I'm told, by the hairdresser, in the hairdressing process. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the proper <laughs> test. Yeah, <laughs> it's a <laughs> um, uh, I'll talk to that, but Deb, I, I just want to say that what you're doing sounds so amazing. And um, I'm, I'm a little bit jealous because it, it does sound like you've got a much... Uh, a stronger base of support, I guess, for a, for a local food system, as well as more diversity in your produce. Um, I think it's actually finding it because nobody, when I tell people what we grow here, they're shocked. And I go, and I think because I'm moving that circle now, I can do the connection. I actually go finding out who's doing what and where. Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't have any dairy here. We've actually just started stocking um, at, from our nearest dairy, which is two and a half hours away. Um, that's about as local as we can get. But we also, our nearest abattoir um, for large animals is in uh, Adelaide, uh, which wow. is about five hours away. So we have no um, local meat. We have no local poultry. Um, Sounds yeah. like a lot of opportunity. <laughs> a lot of opportunity, yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of like flow on effects into our community, I, I think we're, we're still at the stage of um, trying to, I guess we're, we're a bit inward looking still in trying to establish ourselves. So for us, we see it in our growing membership. So we, um, we have allocated all of the land on both the properties that we access uh, to about 20 farmers. And almost every week we're getting a, another farmer come to us saying, can I have a plot? So um, we're actually just scoping out another piece of land at the moment. Um, so in that sense, we're seeing um, a lot of uh, positive impact in the new migrant community in um, being able to do something that they're good at and that um, is meaningful for them and um, helps them contribute back. We, we, um, we got farmers to fill our application forms uh, last season and um, answer questions like, why do they want to grow food? What will they do with that food once, once they've grown it? And uh, almost everyone said it, it it gave them a way of contributing back to the community. They wanted to feel like they belonged to, to this place and this community. Um, and then I guess the other thing which I mentioned was the growing numbers of subscribers um, for the box. So, but we actually, our farmer's market closed um, because of COVID. And I think we gained some subscribers um, because of that and they've just reopened. So it'll be interesting to see if, if uh, some of our subscribers drop off. I also, also just wanted to, um, Deb, ask you a bit more if there aren't any other questions. Um, you mentioned social procurement and um, I do note that one of our new councillors is, uh, has joined us on this webinar tonight. We've got a fantastic new council that just got elected. So um, it, it's something that's on our agenda is, you know, how do you get uh, bigger organisations and local government um, and local authorities to support um, local social enterprises through social procurement? Are you able to talk a bit more yeah. to that? Yeah, so that's, I guess, um, it's been quite interesting uh, for me from a local government perspective uh, to read over documents. So what really um, actually got me going was I read a document that uh, it was a desktop study of uh, the ag in the Clarence Valley and I read through it and uh, I, we have put this year, put 48,000 head of cattle through the sale yards and whoever put that desktop study together actually didn't include cattle. 
<laughs> I thought, oh my God. <laughs> That's why we started Clarence Valley Food Inc. So that we could advocate, network, and lobby and educate um, on behalf of our farming community because there was actually nobody doing that. And um, and even in the four years that I've been a counsellor, not once I have ever have I heard from the National Farming Together crew. Nobody, no one. Because if you're if you don't have a united voice for your farming community in your local government area, you are a fractured voice, I can tell you. So what, what we've done when we started doing, um, uh, pulling together our data was, what well, first thing we noticed, you can't access uh, real-time data. It's um, third par party privacy laws. Uh, you, you just can't access. So you needed to go, I needed to go finding that data myself. Your region will have a, um, uh, a you, you, sorry, where, where do you live? Where do you live? Mildura. Is that, I'm sorry, is that, in, is that in Victoria? It's in Victoria. Yeah. Okay. So in New South Wales, they have a, um, uh, a regional strategies that have been developed by the New South Wales government. So I'm only assuming Victoria will have that as well. And all these plans exist that um, you can, so for instance, recently we applied for a grant and we were able to identify 20 plans that linked into what we wanted to do. That's how you can convince your local government to be a part of the story because at the end of the day, state and federal government is actually looking to work in a more holistic fashion now where you've got your three tiers of government working together and local government, is the closest voice to the people. And through your community strategic plans, when you elect a new council, this is when you need to get your farming community out in force to drive the conversation um, through the economic policy. Because if you don't, you fall off the cliff. And whoever's in your local government area on your council, they just drive their own agenda. All right. So, and I'm not talking about councillors, I'm talking about staff. So that's why when your local council says, hey, uh, we've just been elected, we want to start doing our community strategies, which, or strategic plans, they are there for four years and that's what they refer to all the time. So if you can um, coordinate uh, all the farmers in your community to make sure they turn up to those meetings, um, and it's only once every four years, um, that's where you can get farming put onto the agenda and, you know, just agriculture in general. And then you can look at the policies and frameworks that exist within your local council as well that will support what you want to do so that um, the competing interests like CAS or mining or urban development, um, you know, ag's got a seat at the table and has a really strong voice. Whereas at the moment, even in our region, we're just working on that now in our strategic plans where ag actually really has a strong voice. How's that sound? Sounds like a lot of work, Deb. <laughs> uh, no, it's not actually. Um, if you've got, a, you only need to connect with one counsellor. Yeah. Uh, that's what you elect the councillor for. <laughs> and I guess we don't represent all of the farmers here. Um, you know, most farmers here grow food for export, and that's um, not 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 the food system that we're we're a part of. So. Um, yeah, well, in our um, area here in the Clarence Valley. Uh, our, like I said, we're the biggest employer and have the largest, one in four businesses is um, a primary producer. Uh, and we're forever reminding people of that because at the end of the day, farmers, I actually think farmers are sometimes their own worst enemy because they don't talk themselves up. They aren't big noters, they're salt of the earth. They're just too busy farming to get out there and get in amongst the crap you know, because they're, they're real people and politicking is just sometimes, I'm sorry, crap. And, you know, I see it all the time. So it's just, you know, there's got to be people like me out there who, who just loves and idolises our farms. And I'm more, more than happy to sing their praises and, you know, through research and, you know, through what they do and talk them up because, you know, if they don't do that, if I don't do that, you know, you've got all these other competing interests that come over the top of them all the time.
Thanks, Deborah. Um, we've got one more question for, for Deb um, Bogan Huby here. How do you go about gaining community trust being online? Um, I presume that's talking about the box scheme. So um, the, the box scheme is all the ordering and the payments are done online, but the boxes are picked up um, in person. So we don't do delivery. So pick up is done um, in a four hour time slot on a Thursday afternoon. And that's when we see all the customers. So, um, and we've had, it's great. Like we've had, customers become friends um, because they keep bumping into each other at customer pickup and mo most of the pickup is done by um, younger mums so often with bubs and yeah we've seen like whole mothers groups and things start from um, from that regular connection on a Thursday afternoon. Mm. I think um, I think that's a pretty lovely place to finish on. Thanks so much, Deb and Deb, and thanks to our audience. I hope you've enjoyed being inspired by, as much as I have, by two obviously very passionate and committed uh, members of their community who are driving to bring the community together through agriculture. Uh, some amazing stories. Thank you so much. Um, I've loved the dialogue between you two as well. I think we could uh, leave, you, leave you two talking for a while tonight. Yeah. <laughs> tonight. Um, so for anyone who is interested, we're going to make a copy of this uh, recording available on our website in the next couple of days. Um, and also if anybody is interested in the webinar coming up next week, it is titled Galvanising Hidden Strengths. And we have champions from three different farm, farmer driven networks to share their experiences behind building and strengthening uh, farmer capacity and uh, the things that have surprised them the most uh, with their experiences. So we have Diana Fear, who's the CEO of Central West Farming Systems. They've been doing some great work with women in agriculture. Uh, Ken Drummond, who's a member of Sterling's to Coast and also the newly formed WA Producers Cooperative. And Nikki Curtis, who's the acting CEO for the Growers Group Alliance in Western Australia. So if you've enjoyed tonight, make sure you tune in next week as well. Um, thanks again to our amazing guests like Simone. Every time we've had lots of combinations now, um, Deb and Deb, but every time we hear you speak, we're just re-inspired and we learned something new so thanks very much to you both for your time and uh deborah novak i think you need to get home it's looking pretty dark out there now <laughs> no they're still packing down i'm waiting for my coffee <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> thank you everybody and happy to chat anytime and make contact more than happy thanks very thank much you. Deborah. my pleasure thank bye you. thanks everyone bye thanks, thanks everyone good night, thank everyone. Everyone. Good night.